Thanks. Thanks so much and good morning. Welcome to Obesity Week and to this morning's uh, annual Mason Lecture. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Hall, who's going to provide us a, a great story about energy metabolism, metabolic adaptation. I, I saw Dr. Hall present about a year ago and was fascinated by the story that his research tells, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Dr. Hall received his PhD in physics from McGill, the university's tenured senior investigator at the National Institutes of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, the NIDDK, and he's one of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. His main research interests are the regulation of food intake, macronutrient, macronutrient metabolism, energy balance, and body weight. Dr. Hall's laboratory performs experiments on humans and rodents, developing mathematical models and computer simulations to help design, predict, and interpret the experimental data. Dr. Hall has twice received both the NIH Director's Award and the NIDDK Director's Award. He's a recipient of the E.V. McCollum Award for the American Society for Nutrition, the Lilly Scientific Achievement Award from the Obesity Society, and the Guyton Award for Excellence in Integrative Physiology from the American Society of Physiology. And his award-winning Bodhi Weight Planner has been used by millions of people to help protect, uh, predict how diet and physical activity dynamically interact to affect human body weight. So please join me in welcoming our Mason lecturer this year, Kevin Hall. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, you bet. Yeah. So thanks very much. It's a really an honor for uh, me to be invited to give a a presentation uh, at this, uh, this meeting, and especially for my background as fi um, in physics. Um, probably not a lot of surgeons have heard a physicist give a talk before, so I'm really uh, intrigued to, to, to do this. And the, the, the title of my talk is, Why is it so hard to lose weight and keep it off? And the way that we've sort of come about addressing that problem is to try to quantify the feedback circuits regulating human body weight. Um, and in particular, one of the things that we know is that calorie intake and calorie expenditure are just not independent quantities that be can, can be changed at will over extended time periods. And that there's this complex feedback system that is taking place so that uh, changes in calorie intake will indeed change body weight, but they will also lead to changes in calorie expenditure. And that these feedback circuits are modulated by uh, hormones that are well known to you, like leptin, as well as a whole host of other um, gastrointestinal peptides that are secreted. And um, what we're interested in doing in my lab is trying to quantify, as if I was an engineer, trying to quantify the feedback control strength of these circuits in human beings. We know a lot about the molecular mechanisms, um, very little about how strongly these feedback circuits are employed in regulating human body weight. And just as an engineer might take a system and try to characterize its response, uh, we use data and generate our own data where we manipulate the system. You actually have to kick it, perturb it in some way, and see how it responds. So for example, um, dozens of studies have decreased calorie intake in controlled feeding experiments and uh, measured to see how weight and body fat change as well as how energy expenditure changes over time. And from these kinds of perturbation experiments, we can start to quantify uh, the physiology of what's going on um, inside the body. And so uh, we developed mathematical models of that, uh, that sort of process, of mathematical models of the mechanistic basis of metabolism, not merely statistical associations, but trying to actually model the underlying biology here. And uh, what we do is we use experiments fortunately, that have been conducted over dozens and dozens, well, actually, uh, almost a century of these sort of controlled feeding experiments where we know what people eat in isolated laboratory conditions, and we can measure how their metabolism changes, how their body weight changes, et cetera, et cetera. And we've uh, published uh, these, these uh, models and validated them in a variety of scenarios. Here's a couple of example papers uh, listed on this slide. Um, just if you're interested, here's what one of our models looks like. I thought for the rest of the talk I would just go equation by equation and, and <laughs> illustrate this. You're probably not all that interested, nor is this all that useful. And so one of the motivations of, of my group was to actually to provide tools for people to use um, that are a little bit more useful and simplify these models. And one of the uh, things that we've, uh, we've come up with is something called the NIH Body Weight Planner, 
where you can enter information about your initial weight and height and, and, and sex and uh, answer a couple of questions about your physical activity at work and leisure time, plug in your goal weight, the time frame that you want to reach that goal, and the calculator will uh, give you some estimates about what changes in diet and physical activity you'll have to do to both reach your goal at that time point, as well as what you'd have to do permanently thereafter to keep the weight off. Now, um, so we develop these kinds of models and validate them as much as possible, and part of the, the, the role of my lab is to try to uh, find situations where these models break down. Uh, what are uh, the, the new, what bit of physiology are we missing? And the way we do that is by pushing the system. Um, by looking at extreme examples, and the, probably the most extreme example that I can think of is uh, these contestants who participated in the Biggest Loser competition uh, on national TV. And so we studied um, 16 of these folks uh, from season 8. They all competed on season 8 of the Biggest Loser competition. This is the winner of that competition, Danny Cahill, who lost 239 pounds in about 7 months. Um, you're all surgeons, you know that that's more rapid than you would expect even after a Ruan Y gastric bypass. Um, and they're achieving this by a, an extreme lifestyle intervention. If those of you have seen the show, uh, it's primarily focused, uh, televised, on their exercise, extreme amounts of exercise, and I'll quantify some of that in a, in a moment for you. But they're also changing their diet by a huge amount. This is, after all, a weight loss competition, and we know that uh, diet plays a huge uh, role in determining how rapidly people lose weight. Um, so if you're not familiar with the show, these folks go off to Malibu, California, get isolated on this ranch. They're not allowed to have any outside contact. And they engage in this uh, extreme exercise and diet regimen. And these are the mean uh, data points here for body weight in black boxes and, uh, and fat mass in the open boxes uh, measured with DEXA. And the curves here are the mathematical model simulations of this, of this process. They are losing weight on average, this is the average of the 16 folks, while they're uh, on this ranch in Malibu, California, of about a pound a day. So that's pretty rapid, robust rate of weight loss. Um, and the vast majority is coming from fat mass. And uh, I'll, I'll quantify that in a moment for you, but you can see that uh, after they go home, the rate of weight loss slows down uh, to an average about uh, half a pound a day, so still a pretty rapid clip of weight loss. And the uh, proportion of that weight loss coming from body fat still seems to be uh, a relatively high amount. In fact, if you look at uh, 13 of those folks who were pair matched with folks who underwent Ruan Y gastric bypass surgery, you can see that um, whereas the surgical group had about 70% uh, of the weight loss coming from fat and 30% coming from uh, lean body mass, uh, the biggest loser folks uh, were losing 84% um, eight, of their weight loss was coming from fat. And this might not be too surprising. These folks are engaging in a tremendous amount of exercise, and we know that especially resistance training tends to preserve uh, muscle mass over time. And so uh, at least that's one aspect that's, that's different among these two interventions. I should mention the same amount of weight was lost in both of these groups as well. So um, let's get back to what this intervention was. We used this uh, method called the doubly labeled water method. It's a gold standard way of objectively measuring how many calories per day on average uh, over a one to two week period these folks were burning. And initially they're burning about 3,800 calories a day before they engaged in the weight loss program. In fact, these folks at that time, since the doubly labeled water method is so expensive, uh, they didn't know that they were contestants yet on the program. They knew that they were in the pool of potential contestants. We found out from the producers who was going to be in this pool. I think it was about 60 people. We didn't want to dose uh, 60 people with doubly labeled water and waste a lot of money and never get follow-up data on these folks. This was, uh, and, and these folks basically in their habitual lifestyle where they're not really doing any exercise, they're not immobile, but they, they go about their day-to-day -day life, but they're not doing any purposeful exercise at this point or burning about uh, 3,800 calories a day. Um, now, six weeks into the program, you can see that the total energy expenditure has gone up by you know, many hundreds of calories a day, almost 1,000 calories a day. But by the end of the competition, where the average weight loss now was about 60 kilograms um, after seven months, uh, the energy expenditure has gone back down. And, and we assume that a big part of that is the changes in exercise. Um, so you can see that these folks are engaging at, towards the end of the time on the ranch. 
on an average in about 2,000 calories a day of just exercise. Um, that quantifies to about three and a half hours of vigorous exercise every day, seven days a week. Clearly an unsustainable amount of exercise, right? You, I don't know any busy person who can carve out three and a half hours of additional time in their day to go to the gym and not just be at the gym, but exercise vigorously for three and a half hours the entire time. When they go home and go back to their day-to-day -day life, um, still being a part of this competition, of course, uh, that drops off substantially, but it still works out to about an hour of uh, vigorous exercise every day of the week, seven days a week. Now, of course, most exercises are weight-bearing, and so the energy cost isn't just proportional to the uh, intensity and duration of the exercise, it's also proportional to the body weight. So it's a little bit of an unfair uh, fact of life that as you lose weight, uh, in order to burn the same number of calories, you would have to do more intense and longer duration exercise to do this. And so that's captured in our modeling, and this is uh, in this, this, uh, this example. Now, one of the things that's been sort of promoted in health and fitness magazines for decades has been this notion that if you were able to do enough exercise and preserve your lean body mass and your muscle in particular, um, as we showed that these folks are able to do, losing 84% of their total weight coming from fat, um, that maybe your metabolic rate would not decline because the biggest contributor to resting metabolic rate is your fat-free mass or your lean body mass. In fact, what we observed was that these folks had a dramatic drop in resting metabolic rate. And I'll share with you in a minute how dramatic that was. So far, so good with the curves here, with the model predictions, but I'm going to show you later that this breaks down uh, dramatically and in ways that we still don't fully understand. But uh, basically, these folks have drops in metabolic rate towards the end of the competition of uh, seven or to 800 calories per day. You know, that's a pretty good size meal uh, that these folks are no longer burning um, when they're at rest. Okay. So what do I mean when I say quantifying the, uh, the change in metabolic rate? If I plot the resting metabolic rate as a function of fat-free mass, like I mentioned is the biggest contributor to uh, resting energy metabolism, uh, you can see that uh, there is a pretty significant slope here. Uh, it's about 20 calories uh, per kilogram fat-free mass per day. Uh, that slope of that line uh, is the best fit line for the biggest loser folks. If you look at much larger uh, cross-sectional data sets uh, using many more uh, individuals, they also get a slope that's roughly equivalent to that. You know, somewhere between 17 and 21 kil kilocalories per day for every kilo uh, difference in, in uh, fat-free mass. So what does that mean? It means that if someone is losing weight and uh, they do lose some fat-free mass, for example, this individual, you would expect their resting metabolic rate to move down that curve. Uh, after all, they're a smaller person, they have less fat-free mass, they should burn fewer calories. Um, the, oh, the dark uh, circles here are the biggest loser subjects before the competition. At the end of the seven-month competition, the open circles are representing where these folks fell. So instead of falling along the curve, they all fall off the curve. They're much lower than would be predicted based on their changes in body composition. This is something, this residual is something we define as metabolic adaptation. This is the greater than expected slowing of metabolism that takes place uh, as people are losing weight. Um, and our mathematical model, because it had used previous data, uh, not quite to the same extent as the biggest loser, um, did predict the, uh, the correct drop in, in metabolic adaptation that occurred in this group during the active weight loss phase. How does that compare with Ruan Y gastric bypass? Um, again, a very small study, but with uh, 13 folks who we had measured this in, this is the pair match group, you can see that at six months after surgery in the open boxes here, uh, they experienced a similar sort of greater than expected metabolic slowing um, that uh, essentially dissipated after 12 months. Now, of course, they'd lost more weight at 12 months, but were relatively weight stable at that point. And so that's the, in line with the expectations of our model. Once you've kind of gotten over this active weight loss portion, this metabolic adaptation, we believe, uh, should be much lower in magnitude, if not completely dissipate. The question is, of course, uh, the Biggest Loser folks experienced a very similar degree of metabolic adaptation, maybe a little bit more at the seven-month time point when they're still in active weight loss. Did they go back up after they had restabilized? Um, and of course, I can't share with you data immediately afterwards where we brought folks in and restabilized them. 
Um, but what we did do is maybe something a little bit more intriguing is we brought these folks back uh, to the NIH Clinical Center many years later um, and ensured for the, for the three weeks before that they were weight stable. And um, that was the subject of a, a New York Times article about a year ago. Uh, this is Danny Cahill today, uh, or I guess a year ago, and you can see just visually he has regained much of the lost weight. In fact, uh, two-thirds of the weight that was lost on average in the Biggest Loser competition was regained, although there was quite a bit of inter-individual variability, and we'll discuss that in a, in a few minutes. Um, but the point here is that six years later, they'd regained uh, two-thirds of the weight that they'd lost on average. One of the questions was, what happened to resting metabolic rate, and did this metabolic adaptation disappear as it did in the few subjects that we looked at post Ruan Y gastric bypass, or did it persist? So, resting metabolic rate, and this was this is where our models break down, and we don't fully understand what happened. Resting metabolic rate, despite regaining the weight, and I should also mention they regained fat-free mass and fat mass in complete proportion to the way that they'd lost it. So they didn't just gain fat and keep the lean off. It was still in direct proportion. Um, there, resting metabolic rate was still down by six to 700 calories per day. Despite no longer being an active weight loss, in fact, their weight stable, and, um, and regaining two-thirds of the weight that they'd lost on average. I don't understand this. I still don't understand this. If I correct this for the changes in body composition, not only did metabolic adaptation persist, it seems to have increased. This is fascinating. This is, this is what I live for, is I think I understand something, and then we do the experiment and we learn something very surprising. Um, it's still completely unclear if this is an artifact of the fact that these Biggest Loser folks engaged in such an extreme competition. Um, is it something special about what they did? Is it something special about Ruan Y gastric bypass surgery, which of course we know is special? Or is this some behavior that we should expect, maybe not to the same extent in regular folks who are trying to lose weight in more traditional means. That's an open question. So one of the questions that we had was, okay, these folks regained two-thirds of the lost weight on average, and there was quite a bit of heterogeneity between them. One hypothesis that had been out there in the past was maybe it was the folks who had the greatest slowing of metabolism, the greatest metabolic adaptation, that experienced the weight regain. Right? It makes sense. If you experienced a much greater decrease in the number of calories a day that you're burning, it should be a lot easier to put those calories back on in, in terms of body fat. Turns out there, there, was no, uh, there was no significant relationship between, in fact, no relationship whatsoever, between the amount of metabolic adaptation at the end of the competition and the amount of weight that was regained six years later. So it kind of dispels, at least in this population, that notion that uh, the a greater slowing of metabolism is predisposing folks to weight regain thereafter. In fact, something that was very interesting was that it was the folks who concurrently at six years were experiencing the greatest metabolic adaptation who were the ones that were most successful with weight loss. Now that's very strange, right? Um, it doesn't make any sense unless you reverse the direction of causality in your mind and you think that whatever it is that's allowing the, the folks to keep the most weight off six years later is also driving the metabolic adaptation in proportion. And that's the way that we sort of think about this. It's what we call the spring model of metabolic adaptation. If you're doing nothing to change your weight, your resting metabolic rate is going to be relatively normal. And as you do more and more to decrease your weight uh, by increasing physical activity or cutting calories in your diet, um, you will lose weight, and you'll lose weight in proportion to the amount that you change your lifestyle. But the pullback that your bo their body is, uh, is telling you, uh, this greater than expected slowing of metabolism, will be in proportion to the intervention. At least that's our current sort of working hypothesis about this. So that leaves open the question, what determined weight regain? And that's something that was published yesterday in the current issue of, of obesity and was the subject of a New York Times article that's in the, in the paper today. Um, we took these folks and we broke them into uh, weight loss maintainers versus weight regainers. Um, and uh, we asked the question, what was different between these folks? And it turned out 
that it, there was no difference between the amount of calories they cut from their diet at six years later. The biggest difference by far was how physically active they'd become. Just to kind of put some numbers on this, uh, the folks who had uh, lost, the, the median weight loss was 13% in this group. Uh, the folks who were in the weight loss uh, maintainer group uh, kept off about 25% of their lost weight. They had increased their physical activity by 160%. That amounted to about 766 calories per day, while at the same time keeping uh, from their diet 440 calories per day. So they're, they are both cutting energy intake and increasing their physical activity, and that has driven this pretty remarkable six-year 25% weight loss compared to baseline. In the weight regainer group, on the other hand, they are now also cutting 310 calories per day, no different than the, uh, than not statistically significantly different from the, um, the weight loss maintaining group. Uh, unfortunately, these folks are about five pounds heavier than they were to begin with. And they're also doing more physical activity, about 275 calories a day of more physical activity. That's pretty surprising, right? I mean, these folks have regained all the weight and a little bit more. They're eating 310 calories a day less. That's, you know, a small lunch or so. And they are burning an extra 275 calories a day in physical activity. Um, and, and this suggests to me, it's tantalizing to suggest that maybe something about this competition has reset the body weight set point at a higher level. And even though these folks are very close to their original weight, they're still fighting this resetting of the set point higher. I don't know if this occurs. I doubt that this occurs with less extreme weight loss and regain scenarios, but it is kind of intriguing. And this is kind of putting some numbers on uh, how strongly at least the energy expenditure side of things is impacting uh, the ability for folks to lose weight. Now some people, after the, uh, after the study was published, suggested, well, really the only problem was that these folks didn't go on the right diet after losing the weight. They should have just gone on a different diet. And in fact, um, some folks have suggested that metabolism can speed up with a low-carb diet. And low-carb diets are very popular these days, especially ketogenic low-carb diets, as I'm sure many of your patients have asked you about. Um, in fact, this was an idea that's not new. Uh, Atkins Diet Revolution, the first edition, said in the subtitle, uh, it is the high-calorie way to stay thin forever. And the idea was that low-carbohydrate diets by their nature offer some sort of metabolic adaptation to speed up, metabolic advantage, sorry, to speed up metabolism. And so you could eat even more calories than you were doing before and lose weight and lose body fat. This was the idea. And so we were very interested in this and it has become more popular these days to, uh, to, to make this sort of claim. Um, and it's driven by what some folks are calling the alternative view of obesity as being really a, a disease about altered insulin secretion and causing increased fat stores into uh, fat tissue which suck essentially available fuels from the circulation, slowing down metabolism uh, and energy expenditure. This is a slide from uh, David Ludwig who is one of the proponents of this notion. And it also, by that uh, theory, is increasing energy intake by increasing hunger. So it's sort of turning the usual energy balance phenomenon on its head, still completely within the laws of thermodynamics that I'm so fond of as a physicist, but d uh, inverting the direction of causality. And the point here is that it's the insulin secretion and the regulation of fat tissue under this hypothesis that is going to drive down uh, the uh, energy expenditure. So. To relieve that, all you have to do is decrease insulin secretion by eating a low-carb diet because carbs obviously drive insulin secretion. That will release the brakes on the fat cells to provide the fuels uh, to the body and relieve what they call the internal starvation of the energy requiring tissues of the body, thereby speeding up metabolism. That's the theory. And so we were interested in testing that theory. And fortunately, it's a theory that can be tested scientifically and uh, just to point out, another proponent of this idea is Gary Taubes, who wrote a book a few years ago called Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. And he makes a very bold claim that the only way that a diet succeeds does so because it restricts the carbohydrates, not the calories. 
and that those who lose fat on a diet do so because of what they are not eating, the fattening carbohydrates. The idea being that the insulin driven by carbs is trapping the fat inside the fat tissue. And so unless you reduce insulin by cutting carbs, uh, you're basically going to be doomed to keep your fat. And there's some biochemical evidence that suggests that, of course, insulin plays a big role in regulating uh, fat storage in, in adipose tissue. So there's some grain of truth to this idea. And what he's pointing out in this quote is that if you put people on a, even a low-fat diet, they tend to also cut carbs. They tend to cut calories overall. And so from a lot of the past research, you can't logically disentangle whether or not people lost fat because of the carbs that they cut or because of the calories or the fat. And in fact, no study until the one that I'm about to show you has ever tested whether or not if you just cut carbs versus just cut fat from the diet, do those interventions lead to equivalent fat loss? And so that's what we did. We brought 19 men and women with obesity to the NIH Clinical Center to stay for a period of uh, a pair of two-week uh, stays uh, where they spent seven days a week, 24 hours a day with us. And on one occasion, we cut 30% of their calories exclusively from carbs, uh, keeping fat and protein at baseline levels. And on the other occasion, we kept um, carbs and protein at baseline, but exclusively cut those same 30% uh, of calories from fat and in random order. And so I'm referring those to the RC, reduced carb diet here, and reduced fat diet uh, as RF in red. And so um, the, these folks serve as their own controls. And so we can ask the question, uh, did the reduced carb diet lead to those predictions of this carbohydrate insulin or alternative model of obesity of being able to re reduce um, body fat uh, in these same individuals to a greater extent and speed up metabolism? as was been postulated before. And so what happened? Well, just according to that hypothesis, uh, indeed, only the reduced carbohydrate diet decreased insulin secretion. We measured 24-hour urine uh, C-peptide measurements. It's a peptide that's co-secreted with insulin and only cleared by the kidneys, unlike insulin. And so by measuring how much accumulates in the urine, we can get an estimate of the 24-hour insulin secretion rate. And you can see in the blue uh, box here that only the reduced carbohydrate diet led to a significant drop in, uh, in C-peptide or insulin secretion. And so what that is of the order of 20 to 25 percent. So it's a pretty substantial drop in insulin secretion. And that did not happen when the same subjects received the same calorie cutting only from the reduced fat diet. So it's good that we got the experiment to work. That's basically what you should hear here, is that we're able to uh, manipulate insulin secretion in, in, a, in a known way. Unfortunately for the carbohydrate insulin or alternative model of obesity, it was the reduced fat diet that led to greater fat loss. Um, statistically significant, although I would argue clinically meaningless. This is a, just a physiology experiment. It's not a weight loss study. It's uh, really designed to test these mechanistic hypotheses. And unfortunately for that hypothesis, um, not only did, uh, was the low-fat diet or uh, reduced fat diet um, able to, uh, to uh, cause fat loss, despite no changes in insulin secretion, um, it led to greater losses of body fat in the same people compared to the reduced carb diet. Now, there's no magic going on here. There's no breaking of laws of thermodynamics. In fact, the reduced carb diet, instead of causing this metabolic advantage or increasing metabolism, actually caused a drop of metabolism. So you can see both the sleeping energy expenditure here, as well as the 24-hour energy expenditure as measured using metabolic chambers, um, decreased uh, more in the, uh, in the uh, reduced carb diet phase compared to the reduced fat diet phase. So I would say that these are pretty strong mechanistic data to suggest at least some aspects of that alternative view of, of obesity etiology being driven solely by insulin um, and its effects on, on adipose tissue and uh, changing energy expenditure are, are likely to be at least too simple. But of course, the folks in the low carb community, which is becoming increasingly popular and vocal, complained well, yeah, you cut the same number of calories from carbs, but you didn't cut them enough. You really need to get to, you know, 10 to 5 percent carb diets, and we only got to 29 percent carb diets. Um, so we collaborated with uh, some colleagues at the uh, Pennington Biomedical Research Center, uh, Columbia University, 
and uh, TRI in, in Orlando to do a, a two-month isocaloric ketogenic diet study where folks in uh, stayed in metabolic wards uh, at these different sites across the country for a consecutive period of two months, um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And uh, the first period of time was a sort of a run-in baseline diet where they were consuming a diet that was 50% uh, carbs, 25% uh, uh, of those carbs came from sugar, and 35% uh, and uh, uh, fat and 15% protein. And then after that period of time, we kept the calories constant, we kept the protein constant, but we cut the carbs down to 5% of total calories and the fat up to 80% of total calories. And the question was, did energy expenditure go up, just like Atkins had postulated with his very low carb diet? Um, here's the primary outcome of that study. Uh, this is comparing the last two chamber days on the baseline diet versus the last two chamber days on the ketogenic diet. There was no significant difference between these two. But if you notice carefully on the previous graph, we didn't just have these folks in chambers on those last two days. We had them in chambers two days every week. And so we decided to look at the time course of this data. And it turned out that indeed transiently, there was a very small increase in the number of calories that people expended, but that increase seemed to dissipate over time. In fact, something else interesting happened. The rate of fat loss seemed to transiently slow upon introduction of the ketogenic diet, which is somewhat counter to this notion that uh, reduced insulin and reduced carb diets, by, I should mention, insulin secretion in this study decreased by 50%, so a huge drop in insulin secretion. Um, and the reason that we think that this transient slowing of fat loss occurred was because if you measured, and we did, urinary nitrogen excretion, which is an index of how much protein you're catabolizing, um, despite the fact that we're, these folks were eating a, a, the same amount of protein throughout, you can see that there was this spike in, in uh, urinary nitrogen excretion, likely related uh, to uh, insulins, because insulin dropped by 50 percent, um, is relieving its inhibition of proteolysis and increasing gluconeogenesis in the use of that protein. And so, in fact, we think that these folks uh, lost some body protein, at least transiently upon introduction of the diet. So, of course, you might expect that the low-carb folks and ketogenic diet folks have complained that, uh, about various aspects of this study, including uh, that it wasn't long enough. We didn't wait. To, we should have done a six-month inpatient metabolic ward study. I don't think I'll be able to get that approved by the IRB, although I might be willing to try sometime in the future. Um, so we decided to say, okay, is this a fluke? Uh, is it our two studies that are kind of standouts as, as abnormal in the literature? And so we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of all of the studies that have provided subjects with all of the food, not just in the metabolic wards, but all controlled feeding experiments where they varied carbs and fat but kept protein constant. And these were isocaloric diets. And this was published recently in Gastroenterology. We found 32 such studies. And what I can show you is that there is a very strong statistically significant difference between the lower fat versus the lower carb diets, favoring the lower fat diet. Um, you can see the p-value uh, p is less than 0 0.0001. However, this is a classic example of statistical significance having absolutely no clinic, clinical meaning whatsoever. This is a whopping 26 calories a day difference. Okay, this is completely meaningless, and we're varying here uh, the percentage of carbs to fat in the diet from anywhere from four to above 80 percent. Okay, see so huge swings in uh, carbs to fat. Uh, what about body fat loss? Same sort of story. Favoring the lower fat diet, hugely statistically significant. Um, however, meaningless, 16 grams a day. Okay. So I think this is kind of, a, I think that this story is told, right? <laughs> this is you, changing the macronutrient composition in terms of carbs and fat uh, may have something to do with your appetite, may have something to do with how many calories you choose to eat, but it has very little to do with how many calories you burn and whether the proportion of calories that uh, are lost from the body during weight loss are coming from fat versus lean tissue. So where does that leave us? Well, I've been talking solely about the changes in metabolism that occur and the feedback control of that process. What I'd like to get to is feedback control of appetite. 
I think that's a much more interesting and important question. And so to do that kind of experiment, a perturbation experiment, analogous to the ones I've been talking about where we influence calorie intake, I'd like to have a way to control calorie expenditure and measure how does the body, in response to that calorie expenditure increase, how does weight change and how does calorie intake change? So to, end, to do that kind of experiment, we need to have two pieces. Number one, we need to be able to measure how calorie intake changes over time. And that turns out to be something called the fundamental flaw in obesity research. Um, and it's a pretty fundamental flaw. Um, the point here is that the usual instruments that uh, people use to collect dietary data, things like um, diet records or food frequency questionnaires or 24-hour recalls, might be very instructive in terms of what kinds of patterns of food people eat or uh, how, how much fruit and vegetables, for example, versus meat somebody eats. But we know from those objective measurements like doubly labeled water that I mentioned before are completely inaccurate at estimating how many calories somebody is eating. So if I'm interested in measuring calorie intake changes over time, this isn't going to do it, okay? So we have to come up with something better. And we have something better. It's called that's doubly labeled water method, and we can account for the calories that are lost in the stored energy stores in the body. But doubly labeled water, like I mentioned, is extraordinarily expensive. It costs about $1,000 a dose to do that experiment. So we came up with this idea that maybe, you know, we have all this controlled feeding data, where we have this model of how metabolism adapts and we can make predictions about weight loss that we've, uh, that we've validated in studies that I haven't showed you here today. But maybe what we could do is pose the inverse problem. Measure people's body weight, use the same model of metabolism that was successful in predicting body weight with known calorie intake changes, and now make the prediction for the calorie intake changes that must have underlined the, uh, the observed body weight measurements. Of course, that's all fine in theory. How do you validate it? The way you validate it is by using that very expensive method. And you want to do it over an extended time period. And unfortunately, that kind of data has not been available in the past until a study was conducted under the auspices of the National Institute of Aging, who were interested in calorie restriction experiments in humans. And they went to the expense of using this doubly labeled water method, uh, along with multiple uh, DEXA measurements, to quantify how many calories these folks were truly cutting uh, in their diet. Because, of course, if you can't do the intervention that you want, then you can't measure the outcomes that you're interested in. And I think everybody is aware of uh, calorie restriction experiments in rodents and, and uh, non-vertebrates showing, uh, and uh, also some controversial data in non-human primates showing uh, extended uh, health markers for calorie-restricted organisms. So this uh, study called Calorie was, uh, was funded many years ago, uh, multiple sites across the country, and they collected uh, basically uh, body weight and a whole bunch of other uh, data from these folks and uh, underwent this very expensive procedure over the course of this, uh, of this experiment to calculate or to, to measure changes in calorie intake. And so what we said was, just give us the weight data. And we'll use our model, which is extremely cheap, and we will make predictions about what the calorie intake changes over time were, um, and we can compare it to this gold standard for the first time in, in people. And so here's the comparison that was published a, a couple years ago in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Our model is the blue boxes. You can see that uh, initially calorie intake uh, was predicted to go down by 450, 500 calories a day, and the open boxes are this very expensive doubly labeled water method. And you can see uh, that what's happening here is that the model is uh, within uh, the error of the uh, doubly labeled water DEXA method, and the averages are within 40 calories a day at every time point. So this is really exciting. It means that relatively cheaply, just by measuring body weight repeatedly on people, we can come up with some reasonable estimates about how many calories a day these folks are changing in their diet from the, uh, the habitual baseline. So we can then finally measure if we have some way of manipulating calorie expenditure, ideally in a placebo-controlled way, we would have a way of measuring the calorie intake response. So you might say, okay, well, just get people to do exercise. That'll change calorie expenditure. And of course, um, it does probably change calorie expenditure while they're doing the exercise, but they might not 
move around as much later. Uh, they might alter their, uh, their food intake behavior in a conscious way. There's no placebo control for exercise. Uh, you know that you're doing it or not. Um, we'd like to have another way of interfering with the system because we know that food intake behavior is a very conscious behavior and we'd like to kind of get at more about this, this feedback circuit. And so uh, we came up with an interesting trick in collaboration with some colleagues at Johnson & Johnson who, um, as you know, have a uh, an SGLT2 drug for treating type 2 diabetes on the market, which increases uh, the amount of glucose spilled in the urine at the higher doses that can get up to about 90 grams per day. It's a very simple idea. You're essentially poking a hole in the system and you're leaking out calories, and you can do it in a placebo-controlled way. And the question is, if you do that, do people in this way increase their food intake to somehow compensate as they're losing weight. Uh, so we assess that for the first time and so for the first time have some idea of what the magnitude of the uh, feedback control strength is in humans and so let me share with you the data. The first question is do these folks who go on these SGLT2 inhibitors lose as much weight as you'd predict if they didn't change their food intake and the answer is no, not even close. Um, they only lose about four kilos of body weight despite uh, basically poking a hole in the system and getting up to, you know, 350 to 400 calories a day extra energy lost from the system. They are clearly compensating with their food intake, and for the first time we've measured that. And they are increasing their food intake on average by about 100 calories a day for every kilogram of weight that they lose. So this is pretty interesting. So this is the first quantification in humans of what the feedback control strength of appetite is. And if I compare that to uh, including the biggest loser data, the feedback control strength of uh, what happens on the calorie output side of things, that has a feedback control strength of about a third as much, less than a third, 20 to 30 kilocalories per day for every kilo of weight change. So the feedback control of appetite in regulating body weight in humans, at least according to our preliminary analysis, is much more robust. And so if you're trying to lose weight, you're experiencing both these metabolic changes that are occurring as you're losing weight, but you're also experiencing these appetite changes. So that for every kilo of weight that you lose, your number of calories you burn is going down by 20 to 30 calories per day, but the amount that you want to be eating is also going up by 100 calories a day above where you started. I think this is why people have such a hard time losing weight and keeping it off. And let me, let me demonstrate that just by a simulation example. This is the typical weight loss pattern that occurs with practically any lifestyle treatment for obesity. I'm picking on Weight Watchers here, but there's no reason to do that other than that they have nice long-term data of two years. You can see that people lose weight for about six to eight months, then they sort of reach this plateau, and then they seem to have this slow weight regain on average. And so the question is, what are the energy balance dynamics? What's happening to calories in versus calories out underlying this curve? Traditionally, because most of the focus has been on the things that we could measure well, like metabolism, and we know that metabolism slows down, the ex explanation for this curve was that people can cut calories from their diet as part of the program, but then metabolism slows down until finally at six to eight months, they reach the plateau because they're now burning the same number of calories that they cut from their diet. And so only thereafter will they start to lose adherence to the diet because they're not getting any more bang for the buck. Okay, that's been the typical uh, picture because if you ask somebody what they're doing while they're still losing weight, say at the first month of weight loss, and compare that to a year after that period of time using those self-report measures, they'll report eating the same amount of food. Okay, but we know that those are not necessarily accurate, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. What do our mathematical modeling analysis suggest is actually happening? Well, the blue curve here is showing that there's this dramatic drop in calorie intake that's occurring of, you know, seven to 800 calories a day. The orange curve is showing the slowing of metabolism that occurs, and it's significant. It's there. It's a couple hundred calories a day in this typical lifestyle intervention. Um, but you can see pretty early on, people are what I would call as a physicist experiencing an exponential decay of diet adherence. This is actually very well fit with an exponential curve. Um, and it's by the time those two curves cross, 
uh, that's where the plateau occurs, right? That's where energy intake equals energy expenditure. So by that point in time, their, their food intake is 80% of the way back up to baseline, which is the horizontal dotted gray line here. So that's kind of interesting. What's driving this? So if you think about that feedback control strength, that for every kilo of weight loss that these folks lost, they want to be eating 100 calories a day above average. That's this dashed line, because we know what their body weights were. So even though they're keeping the solid blue curve below baseline, they want to be eating the dashed blue curve. And they're fighting a greater and greater battle the more weight that they lose. Okay. In fact, you might think of the difference between what they want to be eating and what they're actually eating as whatever effort these folks are putting into the program, right? And in fact, that curve is relatively flat, that difference between their appetite and what they're actually eating. So maybe those self-report measures which are occurring at months 1 and 12 where they report not eating differently, those aren't really quantitative measures of uh, their actual calorie intake. They're more an estimate about what people perceive their effort is in engaging in this weight loss program. And then that is only slowly decaying over time. And unless that perceived, unless the effort that they put into the program is constant, they will eventually uh, regain some of that lost weight because they have to fight this uh, physiological feedback regulation permanently. So this is the first surgery slide that I've shown for a while. <laughs> and. I want to share with you some preliminary analysis of what we've done on what the energy balance dynamics look like with surgery. And this is some data that we've um, obtained from uh, Nano Gletsu Miller at Purdue uh, in subjects uh, undergoing Ruan Y gastric bypass surgery. And there's a couple of points here. Uh, one is that, yes, these folks are losing a lot more weight, as you would expect, compared to the lifestyle intervention, and they're plateauing after 24 months. Now, um, and our mathematical models do a reasonable job of predicting the body composition changes that take place. And the kinetics of these changes are also interesting. So how long it takes to reach the plateau, actually I'm not going to mathematically prove it to you, but take my word for it, um, are proportional to that feedback control strength, that 100 calories a day uh, per kilo of weight loss. And that is slower after bariatric surgery than after lifestyle interventions. And that tells us something very interesting. What's happening to energy intake and energy expenditure um, over the course of this, uh, of this intervention? Well, you might look at that light blue curve and say, is there an exponential decay of the surgery effect? Um, because these folks do cut a huge amount of calories initially, they're recovering from the surgery, um, but they, that ramps up also. It just stays much lower than it was than at baseline. And so the kinetics and this effect suggest that Ruan Y gastric bypass is having a huge and persistent effect on this feedback circuit. In fact, what's happening, we think, is that it's both resetting the body weight set point at a lower level, and it's also decreasing the strength of the feedback control of appetite by about 30%. It's doing both of those things. And we get that from the differential between the kinetics of the weight change and what's happening with respect to the magnitude of the persistent effect. Now this is very preliminary, and I know I'm, I'm giving this talk in a room full of surgeons who are doing this kind of surgery on a regular basis. And so what I'd like to invite you to do is, if you have some data to share with us, where we're actually measuring uh, metabolic changes in folks, ideally, if, even if you're not, if you're measuring body composition folks repeatedly over time, I'd be very interested in that data and working with you to kind of do these analyses in a more robust way. And in fact, moving forward, uh, to validate some of these models with doubly labeled water in your surgical groups. So if you're, if you're here, please contact me, NIH, Kevin Hall, <laughs> easy to find. So with that, I'd just like to thank a lot of the folks who've contributed to various aspects of this work, and especially the volunteer study subjects who've uh, participated in these, at times, very grueling studies, staying many, many weeks with us at the NIH Clinical uh, Research Center, and the nursing staff at the metabolic wards who have been really just uh, key uh, contributors to the science, um, as well as the, uh, the folks in the nutrition department who do a, a 
fabulous job designing and, and uh, our diets for us. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. We have a little plaque here for you. Sure. Kevin, thanks so much. Uh, on behalf of the ASMBS, uh, we thank you for that fascinating talk. All the work you're doing to sort of explain what we do as surgeons in relationship to lifestyle intervention. And just a small token of our appreciation uh, for the work you've done and for talking to us today. Thanks very Thanks. much. You bet. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Appreciate it.